Crashing through the sky comes a fearful cry. Cobra. Cobra! Cobra. Cobra! Armies of the night, fearful taking flight. Cobra. Cobra! Cobra. Cobra! Mostly movies, where we mostly discuss movies. Mostly. Thanks. Nice to see you guys tonight. I'm joined by my very special guest. My nice brother, John, you. I'm very happy to have him here on the first time. Thank you. We want this to become a continuous thing. It'll be great. Sounds good. Just because I can't hit those notes anymore. <laughs> Sorry. John was always better at that than I was. We're here to discuss G.I. Joe the movie coming soon to a theater near you. I can't believe I'm going to be saying those words. Um, we're still trying to get Thursday night. We're trying to get... Retreat. <laughs> oh, rest in peace, Chris Lada. God oh, bless you. Lada. Wherever Lada. you are. Or Chris Collins, whatever name he goes by. Christopher Collins was Starscream on the Transformers, and he was Cobra Commander on G.I. Joe. Great characterization. The way he did this voice, man, he sold it. He mm. really made me believe that he was Cobra Commander with that amazing, amazing voice. So we're going to jump around, as we always do with our um, mm. topics, and sometimes we go back and forth. Uh but yes, G.I. Joe the movie's coming back to theaters and I'm still trying to see if I can get there on Thursday. It's going to be tricky or Saturday, either one is going to, Saturday's out, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, how am I going to explain to my girlfriend, I want to see G.I. Joe the movie twice. Uh, I don't think it would be a good idea. Uh, <clears throat> but let's talk about the movie first. We actually watched it recently. I watched it the other night on YouTube. It's also available on iTunes. Uh, or I have the spiffy old DVD. John here has the Blu-ray. I'm quite jealous. Mm -hmm. So one time you got the Blu-ray and I'm yeah, Mr. Blu-ray Blu all the time. I'm like physical what media forever. The oh, the comic? This here? Oh, yeah. There oh, we go. We have this comic book, which just came now, out. This comic doesn't have... The comic itself doesn't have anything to do with the movie. It's, it's basically based on the cartoon. But... Um, it's it's so popular that opening sequence of GI Joe the movie, mm -hmm. uh, or I would say like opening song because really you know. it's like you know the opening sequence I guess would be technically with Pythona, but yes. the the opening song with them on the Statue of Liberty and everything, I bought that comic and it's a cute comic inside, but uh, it has nothing to do with the GI Joe the movie, but it's just so popular that opening song that um, people just you know. And we grew up in New York, so you see something with the Statue of Liberty, it's patriotic, and yeah. hey, you want to buy it. It just makes you feel happy to be an American. Every time I complain about this, that, the other thing, or I got to pay taxes, I'm like, uh. But I watch G.I. Joe, and I'm like, yeah, things are pretty good. We got a, you know, yeah, best country in the world. Very mm -hmm. patriotic. The problem with this opening sequence of G.I. Joe the movie where there's an attack at the Statue of Liberty where I don't know why Cobra thinks... There, it's a good idea to. I think what was happening was that was around the time they just restored the Statue of Liberty, which was yeah. in 1986. Save this the lady, save the lady. Yeah, <laughs> we used to go out and raise money, and well, we turned in our share. Some of our friends, I don't know, but uh, I don't know what happened that save the lady money, we but we the saved the lady and they restored the Statue of Liberty in the save 1980s. The clock tower. Yeah, they saved it, and, and it was a big deal. And, of course, from New York, anything with New York, it's like the Statue of Liberty. And man, it's our home turf. Yeah. Uh, so we loved it. The problem with this opening is that, like some of the James Bond openings, it's such a great beginning, and then you can't, you can't top it. Like we talked about Moonraker, because I love Moonraker. I'm no Raker hater, but <laughs> <Rich Avery. laughs> we talked about how Moonraker has this great opening. With a skydive, and when you see how they had to film that in the seventies before CGI, before all this stuff, you really marvel at how hard these guys worked on making that happen. But the rest of the movie just—it's still good, but it doesn't quite live up to that sequence. And the new song is great, the new theme song, which we did a little bit of it for you. Um, <laughs> I think one, one uh, quick note about Moonraker. Um, I mean, Spy Who Loved Me is a much better film than the one who preceded it. Yes. But I think the big takeaway about Moonraker, it came out right after Star Wars came out, so there's a lot of sci-fi elements in this. Yes. And um, and then, of course, Jaws turning good. Spoiler alert, you know, 40 years oh, later. Oh, yeah, but, Jaws turns yeah, good. Yeah, Jaws turns good. Which but, was like a precursor to Darth Vader turning good. Spoiler again. <laughs> a couple of years later in yeah. Return of the Jedi. It's true. Which mom spoiled that movie. That One day will be an episode of this when we do Return of the Jedi. 
<laughs> We're going to talk about our first viewing and how Mom gave away the ending. <laughs> and, of course, the great Richard it's, Keel. Richard Keel? Richard Keel. Richard Keel. Who we met Who's at also in Keel. Happy Gilmore and other movies. Oh, yes. Twilight Zone. Twilight episode. Zone. He played the cannon to serve man. You should mm-hmm. watch the Twilight Zone, folks. It's great. It's on Hulu. Season 2 is the best. You can actually pick up the Twilight Zone right now. Go right to season two. Watch that whole entire season. If you want to watch the rest of it, go right ahead. Season five gets a little boring, but um, or season four is the hour longs, which can yeah. some of them can really drag. But season two is gangbusters. Every, almost every episode in that season is wonderful. And we'll talk about Burgess Meredith in a second. But oh yes, um, Burgess Meredith is also a alumni of. Twilight, Twilight Zone, but we'll get to that later. I saw Time Enough at last when I was five years old. It was on like a, they, they showed that episode when he was mm-hmm. in the library. And it just blew my mind. And we only knew him from Rocky. Like we knew mm-hmm. him as the old man, the trainer, but mm-hmm. he was so good on the Twilight Zone. Speaking again of season two, the episode, The Obsolete Man, which everybody should watch The Obsolete Man from season two, Burgess Meredith. It will blow your mind. Okay. So we'll find <laughs> out that... <laughs> Cobra is not really Cobra. Cobra is not really Cobra Commander's invention, the way it was in the comic book, which is was kind of weird in the comic book, how Cobra got started. We probably won't go down that route. It's too long. But in the movie, it basically shows that it was from this... There was this group of beings called Cobra La, and they were kind of like these prehistoric humanoid sort of creatures that used a lot of David Cronenberg, like biomechanical... Um, so I like each our Giger, but not like it's a little more colorful. Groundbreaking for its time for a kids show. Yeah. Uh, to do like a lot of this biomechanical <laughs> stuff, it's very very interesting how they put this into this um, kids show, and I it's just very fascinating. Yeah. They do. Like <laughs> like they open like they put a key in it, and it's like a bug. It's like a bug thing. that opens a key to a door. There's a lot of and we have talked about how. A lot of worms and snakes and slime. And we realized that if you're in Cobra Lot, it probably stinks. Like it probably just smells really bad. And I don't think it's a pleasant place to be. But they retreated there after the Ice Age because an age of ice destroyed much of what they had built. Yes. Yes, that I'm point. starting to go and trying to do burgers. I can't do it. But like they... I am globulous. <laughs> yeah. He could make anything sound good. He makes everything sound good. Like, there's one point where, um, I said, this is like the greatest line in movie history, but just the, his delivery of it. He's like, my magnificent fungusoids. Yeah. And I'm like, magnificent fungusoids? That's like, I got to use that in everything now. Yeah. <laughs> my magnificent fungusoids. Every time I cook mushrooms, I'll say, <laughs> my magnificent The edible, fungusoids. not what you think, folks. It's yeah. like, yeah. The shrooms. Shrooms. Yeah. Uh, but it's a more organic-based technology, which is weird because... Um, I even wrote in the, co- the notes. Yes, I use show notes, of course. I'm sorry. I can't memorize anything. Cobra La is the type of place that probably smells awful. <laughs> I uh, keep seeing that. And I'm like, it smells awful. But it's an organic-based mm-hmm. technology, which is weird because they use science up until now. The mass device, five-parter, it was scientific. Uh, the weather dominator, the pyramid of darkness, usually even a rice pen of rice. Well, well, think about it. Like, um, what do they call them? Electric magnetic pulse. So you think of Pyramid of Darkness, it's like EMPs. Yeah. And really, the first time we ever heard the uh, DNA. deoxyribonucleic acid DNA. DNA, first time we ever heard of that was in a rise of Pentor. Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> surprise, <laughs> Pentor. Are ready for a surprise. Cobra La. But, um, then we have these, but then it just doesn't make any sense. And again, these guys are pissed off at Cobra Commander. So the beginning of the movie, Serpento and all the bad Cobra guys basically are pissed off at Cobra Commander, even though I didn't see them doing anything good. And you know what's just funny is that every time they tried to undermine Cobra Commander, like Destro tried to take over twice in the first two miniseries, he messed it up. He should have stayed with Cobra Commander in charge. The Crimson Twins tried to take over in Pyramid of Darkness. And all these guys blew it, but the Cobra yeah. Commander always got blamed. And I didn't like people bashing Cobra Commander because he's just, he's not yeah, he good at his really job. Yeah, he's in this movie. Isn't yeah, it? it's like, it's like a Cobra Commander. And like, he's like really out of, you know, outside of like the good guys like Flint, Lady J, yeah. Shipwreck and we stuff. We love him. And we love all the good guys and stuff. Because he's Roblox. funny. But like, Cobra Commander <laughs> is like, I mean, he's the whole thing. Like he's, he, it's called Cobra, Cobra Command. Command. And you know, he's the commander and it's like. I, he, he really gets the raw deal in this. This is this a guy movie. that put little creatures... <laughs> and we love the actor who plays him, because anybody could do Destro, my dear, Cobra Commander. Well, this is a guy and that Anybody puts... could do that voice over, but to do, Ah, oh, Destro, what puppy cock is this? <laughs> it's, 
That's hard to do. That's like, hard I to don't do. Know. I can, you know, he also did the voice of Gung Ho. He also did the voice of another character. That I'm trying to remember. But he had a great did, voice. What was it Steeler? Steeler. 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 By the way, if you watch Worlds Without End, Worlds which Without is the End. greatest two Part episodes of G.I. Joe, season one, it's the Pyramid of Darkness season, 1985 to 86, Worlds Without End, part one and two, which is a Steeler episode. It is the greatest episode of G.I. Joe. It's a two-parter. We should dedicate this video to Chris Lotta. Yes, he thank did, you. Uh, Chris, we did it before, and I'll say it Star again. Scream, I can't give this guy enough credit because he was there even when the series went away. Like, even when it went to um, decommunications, which was kind of a dark time for G.I. Joe. And I don't think it ever really recovered on TV, at least where the use, the rights lapsed from Sunbow Animation and it went to Deke Communications. And they suck. A lot of their cartoons are just pretty bad. And, and it's interesting because I like a lot of the uniforms. Like, like I do like Cobra Commander in the, like, the metal outfit. Mm -hmm. I like Cobra Commander in the hood, in the chrome dome. I like him in the... Um, you know, the science uh, fiction alpha, you know, like yeah. the space suit and stuff. I like him in all that. And I like how they use that in the comic books. But, um, like they have Night Viper, Alley Viper, and the Deke stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. And I like those outfits, outfits and those uniforms and everything but it's like what that. You do with them. But, um, it just, it didn't. I was watching Dragonfire again, which is takes supposedly takes place after the, yeah, movie, the movie. And it just didn't grab me. So it just, it just it feels just a lot. Really, it feels a lot cheaper. It feels no, a lot smaller. You miss a lot of the voices. All the voices would change except for Sergeant Slaughter and Cobra Commander. And it's a drag because, look, God bless Maurice LaMarche, but Arthur Berghardt is Destro and he has such a perfect voice. And uh, I think Morgan Luftig is it? Like is a Darth Vader type. Baroness, thing. yeah. yeah. Well, in my G.I. Joe script, not to toot my own horn, I wanted Michael Dorn to play Destro. And, and when we had his father, generation. and when we have his father in film too, we go into more Destro's history. His father was going to be James Earl Jones, but that didn't happen in the mid 2000s. It was a good Conan connection too. Yes, cuz I love Conan the Barbarian. It's one of my favorite movies. That's a movie we got to talk Destro about. Destro my son. Yeah, well, yes, when how he passes him the, the gold mask because he's dying. Yeah, baby. And he has the silver mask. He he's has the gold. Yes, <laughs> yes, we had this whole ritual where Destro's father is. This was in G.I. Joe. I love the whole, what is it, Iron Grenadiers or Grenaders? Or yeah, I think it's Grenadiers. Grenadiers. I need Grenadiers. I, I like I their drink. outfits. I like some of the different. Um, Dark Long was pretty and... cool, like a pretty cool like costume. Like yeah. all that stuff from Castle Destro was, was great. Very interesting. But they even didn't... in the comic book how they used it. Yeah, they used it, it better in the different. comic book until they didn't. Because there, then there was just something about that time. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, there was something about that time of just like on Friday on Friday nights, like you'd you'd see GI Joe when you come home from school. Mm -hmm. um, you'd pick up the GI Joe comic book, which was put out monthly, or sometimes they put out the special missions and stuff. It was just such a different time. You'd see those Friday shows like uh, Full House or yeah. you know, whatever. You know, as a kid, you'd see always like different shows. And it was just like a, just yeah. an amazing time. You'd play with the G.I. Joe figures. You'd do, I don't know. Around the time the show time. was winding down and the rights were lost was around the time we got into the comic book. Yeah. Because I remember it was 1980, I would say after the movie. It was probably 88. And it's September, it's October, and there's no G.I. Joe. And we're like, what's going on? Why is there no G.I. Joe? And we're watching the same old reruns over and over. And we've seen every episode a million times from both seasons, mm -hmm. plus the miniseries and the movie. And we'd still watch it, but it was a drag that there wasn't new episodes. And we didn't know what was going on because, you know, there's no internet. We didn't know what was going on back in those days. Mm -hmm. But one day, I remember we were in Walden Books in the mall. Children... Years ago, bookstores used to exist in the mall because mm -hmm. people used to read books. Do you remember those? <laughs> and we found it was issue number 70. I'll never forget. It was a, yeah. The cover was um, Wild Bill was flying a helicopter and he looks like tense, like there's a little bit of sweat and a, there's a gun up to his face. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know what this is about, but I want to check it out. Mm -hmm. So we picked up that one. We also picked up issue 71 and 72. Like those, those were the first three ones we read. Which was interesting because it was an interesting time in the comic book. Not to, you know, go off track and yes. we'll get back to the movie. But, oh, we're but going the, way off in, track in the today, War, folks. In the Civil War, uh, the, in the comic book is around the time in the 70s was the Cobra issue Civil 70s, War. Was the yeah. Cobra Civil War, um, which was interesting. And I'm not going to go into Very interesting. who was the Cobra in the 
you know, the armored suit and who was the Cobra commander in the hood and who's, you know, Very good. we'll get back to that. But, but I'm so. glad that they realized in the comic book something that it took them a while to realize in the show that Serpento really is very, like, pompous and very arrogant, and he's not really charismatic or that interesting. Once you get to a certain point, there's only so much gas you have with Serpento, whereas Cobra Commander they kept on trying to bring back because whatever problems they had with the story, he was at least funny, or his reactions to things were interesting. Yeah. Serpento was just always playing it straight. Cobra Commander was more ironic, mm. and that's why I think he worked better in the long term. And in the comic book, to an extent, it was like that too. But Larry Hama very wisely decided that, look, we've had Serpentor. The, the toy companies made me put this character in here. I don't want this character in here. And he did something great. In issue 76, Sartan shoots an arrow, and that's it for Serpentor. Serpentor won the Cobra Civil War, and he's telling Dr. Mindbender, I can celebrate, I can feel the victory in, uh, you know, in my grasp. And he's talking about all this. Then the next panel is an arrow this close. And he sees it coming. And then he just falls down dead. And I'm yeah. like, that is badass. You know what it is? That was so gangster because it's like... Yes. And, and Zartan did it. Like, Zartan, Zartan is a totally different character oh, from the show. goodness. And into... I mean, some st stuff in the, the second um, miniseries and stuff of G.I. Joe, The Revenge of Cobra, um, you see some cool Zartan stuff. Nothing and like and there's fun stuff in the cartoon, but... In the comic book, Zartan's like a totally different character. Like, he's part of the Ninja Clan. He's part of... You know, very interesting. But, but uh, you know, sometimes Larry Hama, um, sometimes the way he would kill off characters or good characters, you know, yes. characters on the good side, wasn't always the best choices that I would make, the way they died. But um, that was one of those kills where it's like, okay, mm -hmm. he did that good. That like, was cool. Really that was one of the good ones. You know. He has about 40 that I didn't like, but yeah. <laughs> that was one. Yeah, but it was really Oh, good. man. How could you kill Doc like that in issue 109? Yeah. See, to me, that was the so end like of the Soul comic. Viper, it's not even like, yeah, you know, pick, was... pick, pick a guy. If you Let's say you're going to kill off like Major it. Blood, okay? So have Major Blood kill Doc or something. Yeah. Like but you're going to kill a medic? Like, what? what you, that, yeah. was, that was very... It was just so well, bad. I a guy who's not using weapons or anything like that, you really going to kill There were some fans that complained for years that J enough Joes weren't being killed off. I was never one of those fans. I'm no. like, all right, if you don't want to use a character, just don't have them in this story. There's no need to, to kill them off. But, you know, whatever. To me, the Thanks. first yeah. 97 issues of G.I. Joe, Real American Hero, are pretty great. They bring a character back in issue 98 that they should never have brought back, that should have not probably been killed off in the first place. And I didn't like how they handled that. And then it just seemed like after that, they just killed killing people off. And then it got... Also very silly, plus without the cartoon, the only way to, and without advertising, the only way to sell the toy at that point was the comic book. Yeah. The problem with that is the toy companies were coming out with these outrageous things. Yeah. like They were getting more ridiculous, and then the comic book tried to get more serious, and then the comic book just went off the rails. They were having, like... They were bringing in Transformers. Transformers and, and drug stuff. Like, like remember, there was the anti-drug task anti -drug force. Anti-drug task force. And the, the eco-warriors. Eco there's and a stuff. character named Cesspool that was trying to pollute the oceans. And I'm yeah. reading the comic book, and I'm like, why does the comic book, written by Larry Hama, resemble these really lame episodes that I could just watch from, from Deke, you know, they yeah. were really lame. But we're going to get back to G.I. Joe the movie yes, now. I promised you that we're going to talk about G.I. Joe the movie. But, we man, track a little bit. but uh, you know, this is going to be the longest movies. episode. of. This oh, is going to be mostly, 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 mostly movies. movies. You know, as long as mostly we're not... movies, mostly comics. This time. Yeah, no, we're some no, we're comic books. To... We'll talk about the GI well, Joe video well, games. Let, let's uh, mention one thing. The the speaking recruits. of killing off characters, now we're assuming that you've seen GI Joe the movie. Oh yes. but they were supposed to kill off Duke. And um, I think, like looking back at it now, I'm so glad they didn't. Yes. Um, because some people say, well, it would have drawn like emotional. It's like no. I've seen too many movies. I've seen too many new Star Wars movies where they kill off characters that we love. Oh. And, and maybe not in the best way. And I'm just like, you know, I'm tired of seeing my favorite characters. Because most likely, they'll probably um, retcon Indiana Jones when it comes about next year. Not to get into a rant about that. And they'll probably find a way to kill his character off, even though they have him in his yeah. 90s talking about when he was younger, Indiana Jones. But but they'll find a way to do it. It's like, design. why kill off all my favorite characters? Life is bad enough. Like Life's not enough depressing. You can't go to this to yeah. escape. 
And you're having things where they're playing in Cobra Law, where they're, you know, opening a door, door with, with a, a clam with a, or something. With a clam or something, you know? And it's like uh, shooting out these spores and stuff. It's like, oh, I mean, it it, it's, it's interesting. Like, what I, like about, what I like about G.I. Joe, and, and if you look at those five miniseries, you know, you have the first one with the mass device, the second right. one with the, um, uh, Weather, the Dominator. Weather Dominator. Third one with Pyramid, Pyramid of Darkness, Darkness, which is probably the best out of all of them. Yes, my um, favorite. I think close to right behind that is Arise Adventure Arise. Yes. The stuff that some people don't, people think, um, some pe- there are some people in some camp that think Sergeant Slaughter wasn't, you know, the best thing for G.I. Oh, Joe. Oh, he was so I, I think he was great <laughs> in that, and I think he's great in the movie, which we will get to. But, but so, And then the, then the fifth <laughs> miniseries, yeah, it's the movie. The movie. And I think those five miniseries, like... Put the, put to the side the show for a second, and I love the show. I mean, I love it's the great. show. It's great, and it's fun, but they have a lot of individual episodes. There's some two-parters here and there, but they have a lot of individual episodes with certain missions, and that's it. But with um, the Games Master. But no, they, oh, but what, what's interesting about those five <laughs> miniseries is like you could take them as their own separate movies. Yeah. You could watch them straight through. We used to do that. We used and, to tape um, them and watch them as movies. And they're interesting. You know? Like What I like about it is that there's... There's something different for everybody. Like yeah. one of the critiques of the movie, and getting back to the movie, one of the critiques about the movie is that um, some of the main characters, like you don't see a, hardly anything with Snake Eyes. Nope. I mean, he's in a plant the, the entire thing. Oh, <laughs> he's like basically God. like, you know, but the you one do have great sword. scenes you with Roadblock. I mean, some of my favorite scenes in this. Yes, the Roadblock you know, Cobra, Cobra Commander stuff Commander is stuff great. Isn't... You're making me crazy. Yes. <laughs> I was once a man. Oh, Amazing. my favorite line ever is is like you know it's like straight. men may rule serpents so never. never. I'm like oh well you know maybe not having arms and legs might might draw a distraction. I like that robot kept with the mind <laughs> scheme during yeah. that because most people don't know he's a heavy gunner and he's a cook, but he also is sort of like a you know I would say very poetic. Very he would rhyme thing. Yeah. Cobras through. What do we do? Cobras through. It says. Uh, <laughs> Play straight, there's no doubt. I'll turn your eyeballs inside out. <laughs> I just, and he said great stuff even in Revenge of Cobra when he's with Han Delu. Oh, man. That my, one of my favorite, like, what is it they call it? The fourth wall type thing? What is it? Breaking the fourth wall. Breaking the fourth, fourth wall when he's like, oh, he'll fight for freedom wherever he's traveling. He's singing the G.I. Joe Joe's song. here. It's like Roblox singing the G.I. Joe In Revenge of... I remember watching like, that as a kid. I'm like, here. I'm like, oh, my sing the G.I. Joe, Joe song. But it's a real song because remember there was an episode of Called Cold Slither, which is Cold so good. Cold Slither, you'll be joining yes. us. Yes. We're going to get copyright strikes for all these songs. Oh, yeah. We'll try and... I don't care. Sue me for what? Sue me for what? Rocky Five is awesome, by the way. We'll get to Rocky Five. <laughs> but um, at the end of the Cold Slither episode, if you remember, they actually play the G.I. Joe theme, and rock and roll is on drums, and yeah. it's really cool. That's definitely a, a great episode. And we always had a theory that Footloose was always high. And even in the series, and we know that at that rock concert, at Cole Slither, you know, he's definitely um, smoking something. Yeah. Probably. Something good. But if you listen, here, here's a little thing about Cole Slither. You Cole Slither fans out there, listen to Joan Jett's song, I Hate Myself for Loving You. Don't if copyright you Listen strike. closely to that song because it's like... That uh, sounds like Cole Slither. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 Just like the song Shine uh, 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 by Newsboys is I Believe in Miracles by whatever that... And shine uh, yeah and that's uh, don't don't uh, don't uh, yeah don't oh, okay. don't sing because we're going to get sued by somebody but let's talk about the new recruits okay. on the G.I. Joe <laughs> team they're also <laughs> called we're going over by Beachhead the this Raw is our Hines. first video together so we're this is our Barry Lyndon like if yeah. you guys can get through this episode then you'll follow us to the abyss of oblivion <laughs> um, so we weird. have Tunnel Rat Jinx Law and Order Chuckles <laughs> Big Lob who Big was Lob. Big Lob was a new. basketball player not made into a toy, unfortunately. Would you have bought a Big Lob doll? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. I think I would have. I, would have I mean, I would have bought everybody else first. Because I'd probably do like, I'd have him like, you know, yeah. he'd probably be there. But I would have bought, so he'd be like, he'd probably come you know, with basketball. That would be pretty cool. Because they did have the guy, hardball guy, so they had a baseball guy, and I'd have a basketball yeah. guy. And then they had one who was like uh, a football Captain player. Captain Gridiron. Yeah, Captain Gridiron. Captain so it's Gridiron. like you got, you know, then you just need a hockey player with the... By the time... Jason Voorhees. By the time Captain Gridiron came around, I was still buying G.I. Joy... G.I. Joe toys. G.I. Joy. Joy. <laughs> I was still buying G.I. Joe toys by the time Captain Gridiron came around. But even then, I was like, nah. nah. You know, He was in the video game for the NES, which is 
hard as F. Hard <laughs> F. It is hard yeah, F. Hard F. F. But I I've beaten it and I played it again recently and I beat it again. Of course it's it hard me. Affleck? It it okay. took me several tries and I tried G.I. Joe 2 and you think G.I. Joe 2 is made by Capcom? Oh, it's made by Capcom, it'll be easy. No, G.I. Joe 2 mm. is hard F and I did not finish it because I'm like, no, life is too short, I'm too old. I'm going to go on YouTube and watch some kid in uh, Canada beat this game. Yeah. Uh, and now these new recruits, Tunnel Rat, Jinx. Mm -hmm. Tunnel Rat was based on Larry Hama, the writer of the comic books. Yeah. He was kind of I a shorter like guy. Figure, like the look of him and everything. Yeah, yeah, he had an interesting look because he was wearing nice slacks. He didn't have jeans or anything like that. And his idea was he was an infiltration I like the rag. <laughs> on his head. He was like, the do rag was good. Yeah. He was a cool guy. There's Jinx, which is not mentioned in... By the way, I looked up her file card online, the G.I. Joe file cards. Her name is classified. In the comic book, you find out that she's actually Storm Shadow's cousin. She's an Arashikagi. That's the last name. And <laughs> she's from the Japanese side. See, ja Storm Shadow in the comic book was Japanese-American. And the clan didn't exactly appreciate that he was of... Mixed origin, but they still accepted him in. They still let him in run the family business because, the family business. because you know, he was still family, even though they didn't like the idea that his mo mother was American, um, which I thought was fascinating. An issue. I wish it was something they dealt with on the show, but they never dealt with that on the show. Although I think they did bring the nin ninjas in in the Deke series, but by the time they brought them in, I wasn't even watching the show anymore. Um but well, you know what, and this, the, the the new recruits in um, uh, G.I. Joe, the movie and stuff, and, and throughout G.I. Joe, like we talked about Roadblock, we talked about different characters. Um, uh, G.I. Joe, and I'm only going to spend a few seconds on this, but G.I. Joe always had a diverse cast of characters. Yeah. It showed that everybody, we're all Americans. Yes. We're all working together. It doesn't matter, you're black, Native American. Um, yes. Yes. You know, white, Hispanic, it, does, it doesn't matter. Whereas Asian, Cobra was always... It, it, everybody worked together. And, um, well, Cobra was always like uniform, like, you know, everybody... Uniforms. And, and things like that, except for the bikers, the dreadnoughts. <laughs> no, but even the dreadnoughts were all white. There was no yeah. diversity in, yeah. the, in the pool because then it was never said, but these were the bad guys. And the bad guys did not want to have people of other cultures or other things. Yeah. Whereas what but was... But it didn't beat you over the head with it. It, it yeah. showed it's like... We can all work together. We don't have to, like, you know, because sometimes, mm -hmm. and I'm only going to spend two seconds on this, but sometimes in movies you feel like people are just, like, forcing things or beating you over the head with stuff. It's like, I grew up, because one of the greatest things about uh, the military is that um, for things like this, integration. It's like, yes. you know, I, I don't care what color that guy is next to me. I'm going to do everything I can to protect him. Uh, to save yeah. him, if he's got shot in the battlefield, I'm going to pull him back into the, yeah. uh, you know, foxhole, right. and I'm going to try and save his life. Mm -hmm. So that that's that's all I'm going to say about that. But what I'm saying is, there's no there's no color, there's no you know, it's like mm -hmm. we're all team members, we're a we team, all work together. What did you think? That's what I loved in Revenge of Cobra. I loved how Storm Shadow. There's a great piece between Storm Shadow and Spirit, where they're both going to die unless they work together. And these are enemies, and they hate each other, and they're having this really cool fight. But I think the reason why they gave that to Spirit instead of Snake Eyes is that, unfortunately, as great as Snake Eyes is, he doesn't speak. So it's hard to give that to him. So a lot of times you could tell, well, this would obviously be for Snake Eyes if this were a comic book, but you can't really have him speak. Um, there's Law and Order, yeah. who's a, um, a military police. But joining the G.I. Joe team and he has a dog named Water. And um, <laughs> then there's Chuckles, who's supposed to be an undercover agent. He doesn't speak. He doesn't say anything. Yeah. And, and he was not much of a character. Like, he was a little bit in the comics. And he's pretty cool. And I cool. think somebody had mentioned that on his file card. He says he has a very quick wit or something. Yeah. Which is funny because he had no lines in the movie. He had no but lines. A quick <laughs> note about that and we'll move on to the next one. Uh, someone told me that if you see the opening of Casino Royale with um, Daniel Craig... Uh, Daniel Craig he says, look how he's dressed in that with the khakis and the, the shirt and everything. They says he's basically Chuckles That's on perfect. screen. So I'm just seeing it now. So That's if you're great. a Chuckles fan, definitely watch the opening of Casino Royale with Daniel Craig. And then there's Lieutenant Falcon, who is played very well by Don Johnson. He has a lot of chemistry with Jinx. Yeah. Um, Jinx is an interesting character because even though she's supposed to be Japanese, according to the, the 
the com the comic well, and all she's that. related to storm shadow. she's related to storm shadow but the actress i think it was something wrong with the voice because like i couldn't tell i used to i grew up thinking she was like like latina, latina. So I, I i didn't know about that but now that i watched it again i tried to say well is she supposed to be japanese and i think you can kind of it's kind of the toss-up for me yeah. But I think she has good chemistry with Falcon. I both I like how yeah, they both wise they work, with each other. They work well. But with these new recruits, Falcon, Jinx, Law and Order, do you feel safe with them? Like if you feel you were <laughs> in any real danger and like there was a, a bad guy coming to get you or there was a guy that had hostages, do you really think Chuckles or <laughs> Tunnel Rat is gonna I, I, help I think, you out? I think the thing with Tunnel Rat, I think out of all of them, he looks like the most um military like like in, in the sense that like he's like a SEAL team six guy or He's like works under the tunnels or under the things or he's like sinking around like a Navy SEAL or something. But um, but I, I think like, yeah, he'd probably like sneak away and stuff while yeah. you're dealing with all the bad guys. <laughs> no, I'm so now let's talk about something very interesting. Golobulus. Golobulus. Played by Burgess Meredith. Burgess Meredith. From Rocky Burgess Meredith. and Batman and several great programs. He played the Penguin in Batman. Batman. He was the uh, 1960s Batman. He was like we mentioned Twilight Zone. Um, also, I was watching Clash of the Titans again, the original. Oh, that's Clash right. Of Titans. He's in there. He, he was the mentor in that. He's like, get up, Percy. You know, yeah. <laughs> Percy is right. It's like, a... get up, you Greek tragedy. It doesn't make me like tragedy. <laughs> and it's like, uh, he's great. The character is weird. It doesn't make sense. Again, they're giving Cobra Commander a lot of crap for screwing things up. And look, Cobra Commander has magnificent fungus oil. Yeah, it, it's, Cobra Commander did screw up a lot. He did. But if so you Pentor, remember anything from this video, just remember Magnificent, magnificent Fungusoids. Fungus fungus hashtag Magnificent. <laughs> hashtag Magnificent. That's the okay. hashtag. Anyway. Um, the problem is they were giving so much to Sepentor, like he's some kind of a prince or some kind of a... But meanwhile, Cobra Commander was their guy. He was actually from Cobra Law and he actually lived there and he was the chosen one to go out and, you know, raise the army and take out, um, take over the world, conquer the world, so Gilabulus could run things. But, you know, at the same time, they're still blaming him for all the mistakes. And, and Serpentor didn't yeah. really do anything. You know, I don't remember much of season two because it's been a while. I mostly just watched the miniseries. Well, the irony, like, if you, if you look at Cobra Commander, you know, before the spore blows up, um, he... He sort of looks like he sort of looks like a blue Destro. You know, he's got the bald head. He's got, yeah, it's you know, weird. It's um, weird. But anyway, uh, the, the interesting thing, and I'll just talk about the comic for two seconds here because we're staying with the movie. Well, um, mostly the the comic. I think was a little bit, um, uh, you know, because this is the first time in the show that we're seeing him without his mask. Yes. And, um, you know, so we don't know. Like we saw, like those eyes form and stuff after he had the spores. We don't know exactly what he looks like after the spores. Um, they allude to it in one of the comics, in one of the shows, where he's like, oh, I don't want to see you eat and everything like that. You know, D uh, Destro says, I don't want to look at you eating and stuff. He's like, what? Is yeah, it? cover your face. Yeah, cover <laughs> your face anyway. But, but in the comic book, I think they make it, because when they show him without the mask, but they says that might be a disguise. He looks like Ringo Starr, actually. Yeah, he, <laughs> he looks has like, like a mustache, glasses. Yeah, like and... the handlebar mustache. But that turned thing. out to be when they finally show what he looked like was when he was shot in issue 61. And that's what he actually looks really like. really should not have come back from that because he was not only shot, but they drove him upstate for two hours and they buried his body. And then like way later in issue 98, I'm spoiling issue 98, which I wasn't going to spoil, he comes back and what happens is his loyal Crimson Guardsmen um, like in the comic book, the Crimson Guardsmen all had plastic surgery and they were supposed to be infiltrators. So they'd work at your tech companies, they'd work in your government, they'd work everywhere and they all looked the same. They all had this plastic surgery where they would have red hair and um, just like very white Anglo-Saxon features. Yeah. But it could just be any anonymous person and they were all named Fred. There was like Fred 7, Fred 52, yeah. all that. It's sort of like, who's the actor who, so when they uh, did, who played uh, Two-Face? He looked like Robert Redford. Red, he kind of, Aaron Eckhart. Aaron yeah. Eckhart. If you well, think like, of the actor Aaron Eckhart, they yeah. look like that with red hair. Basically. Well, like a Robert Redford and type. And they thing. They were all named Fred and they, they dug up, they dug up Cobra Commander's body when they dug him up, he had the red hair and he looked just like the guy. But, I don't know how yeah, he survived that. Did he have... Um... Yeah, he didn't have the disguise. That was just real, his real face. Oh, he looked like a Fred. He so... looked like one of the Freds. 
Oh, so when he had the disguise, that's when he had the mustache and he looked like Ringo Starr. That was a disguise. So, like, the whole thing was he took his mask off, but they never really showed him with his mask off until they were digging him up in issue 98. Now, Destro, on the other hand, was great because he's from Scotland, and Larry Hama always figured Sean Connery Mm -hmm. would be a great... Like Dr. Doom. He always figured Dr. Doom type, but he always figured Sean Connery was Destro. Should have so, nailed it to the mark. Yes, Cobra Commando. <laughs> Imagine yes, Cobra Commando, the weather dominator. <laughs> so uh, you, you know, it'd been great. So I wouldn't have to. The mash device. The mash. That device. would be great. No, but what he would always figured it was it was always Destro would be Sean Connery. So when Destro finally takes his mask off in issue ninety seven, which to me is the last issue of the comic book, after that you could continue, and there are individual great issues. And the last issue, one fifty four. Is it? I think the, the last issue is great where the kid writes a letter to Snake Eyes. Actually, one of the Freds has a kid and he writes a letter that he wants to join the military. And it's a great story. You could tell it's a story that Larry Hama like, had probably in a desk drawer. And it's like, okay, when they cancel us, this is the last story. Because mm-hmm. there was really so many unresolved storylines at the end of that book. Because I did read some of them again and they're just not interesting to me, really. But that last issue was great. But when Destro takes his mask off at issue 97, he looks just like Sean Connery from, like, the 60s. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's Dr. No Sean Connery exactly, right there. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful, because the Baroness is finding out that, you know, her whole career in terrorism from that great Snake Eyes trilogy of 93, 94, and 96, those four issue series, which was supposed to be a graphic novel drawn by Todd McFarlane, but yeah. they didn't want to, Marvel didn't want to spend the money on Joe. They didn't want to spend the money. Oh, my God. But uh, that would have been amazing. By the way, a great movie with Sean Connery, you know, other than his Bond films and Untouchables and all that, a great movie with Sean Connery, I see every St. Patrick's Day, Darby O'Gill and the Little Kids. Yes. It's very corny, but it's so fun. It's really, really fun. Patrick's, St. Patrick's Day is wild. And you can away. see Sean Connery singing, so. Yes, and he's not bad. Yeah. It's all right. Better than Lee Marvin singing in Capaloo. Or yeah. was it Paint Your Wagon? Paint Your Wagon was when Lee Marvin sang. Ooh, Paint Your Wagon is rough. Kapaloo is pretty rough, too. But I love Lee Marvin. Lee Lee Marvin is so awesome. He's in The Delta Force, which is very close to a G.I. Joe movie. Yeah. If you haven't seen The Delta Force, it's like... it's Chuck Norris and Lee Marvin. Oh, it's so badass, that movie. It's great. And and, and, And um, that song... Yeah, Alan Silvestri did the theme song. Mm -hmm. We're going to get another copyright Oh, Alan Silvestri. Alan Silvestri. And Mm -hmm. after Back to the Future, he did the Delta Force. And he'd probably rather forget that. But, uh... And then... Yeah, Yeah. very similar. Yeah, I'm starting to think about that now. Yeah, Yeah. it's sort of like how James Horner did Star Trek II and then everything was Star Trek II after that. I just, like, hum hum the songs. But basically... He always imagined that would be what Destro really looked like. And he yeah. was a really handsome man. Because the Baroness is leaving Cobra, she's done. And he basically decides that he's leaving behind. He hasn't been a part of Cobra. He left Cobra... Sna- in the comic book, he left Cobra way early. Yeah. And he was doing his own thing off in Scotland. But he was still around. And he was still sort of part of Cobra. Like, sort of. But... He mostly. basically left mostly. He was mostly part of Cobra, mostly. mostly. But he left for her. So we're getting way yeah. off track. And yeah. how does the we movie... We're so much fun talking about yeah, it. Yeah, it's just great talking about G.I. You're going to learn more about G.I. Joe in this episode than you oh, ever, yeah. than you ever wanted G.I. to Joe learn. Fan, you know. and, and by the way, another plug. Um, we're more G.I. Joe guys than Transformers. We like certain episodes yes. of Transformers. But if you... Ever want to read one of the greatest comic books ever? Uh-huh. If you're a fan of the show and a fan of the G.I. Joe comic book, and or or you like both, which I do, um, or you love both, I would say um, uh, definitely check out Transformers vs. G.I. Joe. I think yes. it's by Tom Scioli and John the, Barber. The new one, yeah. yeah. Very good. It's yeah, it was, it a lot came of out fun. just a couple of years ago. A lot of fun. Because so. um, it really embraced the. And I think it's Transformers, not G.I. Joe vs. Transformers vs. G.I. Joe. Very, very so good. unfortunately, um, the Sorry. movie wraps up nicely. Duke is severely wounded. They decided because of My Little Pony and Transformers, the movie did not do so well. And furthermore, parents groups were quite up in arms that Optimus Prime died in Transformers, the movie. So they decided for G.I. Joe, the movie, that they decided not to kill off Duke because yeah. they didn't want to piss off family. And with Transformers, the movie, 
I never really mourned Optimus Prime that much. I'm a casual fan of Transformers, but I always thought Trans Optimus Prime. My friends in school were devastated when Optimus Prime died. They were. They said they cried in the theater and stuff. And but I'm like, but he's a robot. They'll just fix him. Yeah. And they <laughs> looked at me like I was the worst person around. And I'm like, but they're just gonna fix him. And they're like. He can't be fixed. He died. I'm like, but he's a robot. Like they're gonna, yeah. they're gonna. Sure enough, six months later, there's a commercial. I'm watching Transformers one morning, and Optimus Prime shows up and says, "Heroes never die," yeah. and he's gonna be back. And he it's says, like, "Of course I'd be back." Yeah. yeah expect, you know? So Transformers, unlike GI Joe, Transformers gets a season three, and it's the worst tr- season of Transformers. And they bring back Optimus Prime because Rodimus Prime sucked. Rodimus. Like nobody liked Rodimus Prime. Everybody's watching that. They're like, well... I mean, the name is Rodimus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is stupid. It was Hot Rod. Hot Rod. And the then three they called things I remember. Rodimus I've only Prime. seen Transformers the movie a couple of times. It's but right. the three things I remember about it is, you got the touch. Yeah, stop. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop saying. But, and and um, secondly was that scene when they're throwing people in the pool. Oh, yeah, with the, with the sharks. And it's like, go Yeah. Um, and then uh, the third thing... When they play thing, Dare to be Stupid. Dare to be Stupid. I have to give my props to Transformers the movie. It had Dare to Be Stupid, but, you know, yeah, but remember, the movie had Crush. And, yeah, but I remember when they played Dare to Be Stupid in Transformers the movie, and I'm like, well, they're not going to have the lyrics, because, like, then it would just be, oh, look, there's the lyrics. I guess we're doing that now. Yeah, I did yeah. like Eric Idle as uh, Rakgar, the guy the in the Trash Planet. Yeah, the mm-hmm. guy that ran the Trash Planet. Eric Idle was pretty good. <laughs> Orson Welles, in his final role as Unicron, there are things I love about Transformers the movie. It's a good movie, but I'm going to put it out here right now and say that G.I. Joe the movie is a better film. Mm-hmm. I think that it's it's not... I don't know. Transformers the movie had great animation, and it was pretty ambitious, but I just think I like how this movie wrapped up. That so, yeah, I think also with G.I. Joe, you have the depth of characters, the personality. Yeah, the writing is just I better. Mean, you, it's, it's just... And, and also... Like you were saying that there was a lot of stories going on at once. You know, for, again, a kid show, there's a lot of stories going on at once. One of my favorite scenes, seeing it again, is, um, and, I, and I actually enjoyed the Cobra Law stuff again, because I was always into sci-fi. We were into Star Wars first, before G.I. Joe, so we didn't mind them implementing some sci-fi elements. There were certain G.I. Joe yeah. fans that would want more, like, military gung-ho stuff, which is great, but it's like, I don't mind them implementing some sci-fi in there once in a while. But the thing is, I'm all into ancient aliens now and looking at things. (laughs) Of course you are. So I'm like, I'm very much into maybe because Cobra Law put it in my head. Oh, the psychic uh, motivator. Yeah, the psychic motivator. Um, But anyway, (laughs) um, but another great scene um, and see how it's cut. And I I think this is a great thing. Even if, let's say, you're writing a script or you're putting together Mm -hmm. uh, the scene when he's talking to Jinx about... um, Breaking oh, in. how they're breaking in. And yeah. then you're seeing them break in while he's saying, well, they're going to yeah. have three of our best guards. And they're going to have this. And they're going to have to do that. And then they're going to get reinforced concrete. They can't get through that. And you see a yes. monkey wrench put down the That's bomb, how, um, and, you know, I like that type of thing. We saw yeah. stuff like that years later on Alias. Remember, that was a regular thing on the show Alias. Yes. Where she would talk about how they would sit in the planning room, how they were going to do it. And they would cut back and forth between Sydney Bristow doing it. Yeah. Um, well, the, which yeah. is great because you can have the exposition, but you could also have action. you're seeing the action take place. Now, um, so basically, Duke does survive. He's in a coma, and basically, Sergeant Slaughter, who comes into this film late, he comes in almost yeah. an hour in. It's an hour and a half movie. He's really only in the last thirty minutes of this film. Yeah, but he makes such an impact. I don't like Slaughter's Marauder. Uh, uh, no, Slaughter's Marauders is later. I'm thinking of yeah. the Renegades. Renegades. The Renegades is those three guys. Yeah, I like the guy um, who's Red the Viper. Dog, yeah, Taurus and Mercer and Mercer. Yeah, you don't want to catch because he's like a mercenary Mercer. and he's like yeah. you know he he was originally a Viper and I always liked like his look and everything. Like I always liked the Viper. Yes, toys because uh, the the, the viper toy, the viper look like that's what uh, one of the things why I like a rise of surprise. Uh, surprise! I keep saying surprise, <laughs> surprise. But We're not gonna um, cut that. Either. What We're I love about that, yeah, we'll keep that. <laughs> um, what I love about that that look is that they look like little Cobra commanders. They're not just like you know Cobra soldiers with the little mask on, the and, metal and, mask. Yeah, yeah. like idea. They, they actually look like you know. Mini Cobra Commanders, you know, like mm-hmm. anyway, like the Sardaukar. I always like their look to them with the red gloves and the 
You yeah. Know, just the blue and the... The, the, the really thing cool. is, again, Slaughter's Renegades, those three guys. Yeah. I feel like they could, if you're in trouble, if you're really... I would trust them more than the new recruits. Yeah, yeah, I would trust them a little bit more, but I think that I would probably... I'd come out with a few scars, but I would probably come out alive. Yeah. Because those guys are pretty bad. They're pretty, yeah. like, pretty tough. Yeah. Um, and they get together, they team up, and all these stories converge. The Sergeant Slaughter story with Falcon... Um, all the guys trying to break into the Himalayas plus yeah. Cobra Commander and Roblox, all the stories <clears throat> kind of converge at once. And I like that they realize that it's over. Mm -hmm. They defeat the bad guys, but they realize that it's over and this, these pods are going to mutate all of humanity. Oh, by the way, before we get to the pods, one quick thing. One of my favorite cuts in movie history yeah. is with Roblox, who's one of my favorite characters in G.I. Joe. Oh, who's so freaking when he out. sees Lifeline, <laughs> don't freak out. Like, Lifeline! <laughs> And then the next, ah! the next scene is like, yeah, he's standing <laughs> like, straight. Oh I'm like, what? That was a, that was a really his, abrupt cut. They don't explain but, how his eyesight comes back either. That was weird. Yeah. Um, but then, the the point is, all of stories converge. They all come together. And th and that was devastating. I'm sorry to interrupt. That was devastating when he's like, oh yeah, I could fix his eyesight. But, but I can't do anything do for Cobra same. Commander. I Once again, like, Cobra oh, Commander gets the shaft. Like, yeah, Cobra, Cobra Commander, Commander gets the shaft again, and until. Cobra Commander actually saves humanity. Yeah. Because Falcon, I believe, is fighting with Serpentor and it's done. And he's gonna and, and then the snake is getting it's killing Falcon. Mm -hmm. And Cobra Commander, as a snake, attacks the other snake and gets him to, you know, it, it basically gets Serpentor gets taken out, and then Falcon is able to go up to the BT. Of course, he has a fight with Globulus in which Globulus, he stabs him in the eye. Yeah. And uh, that's something that for one shot, you see Globulus's eyes all messed up. So then he gets the BT. It appears that they can't save humanity. And the, the pods are um, already deployed. So I thought for a minute, as a kid, I thought, ah, oh, this is going to be really cool where the whole human race becomes these like vicious monsters and like only the G.I. Joes and a few Cobras are the only ones that survive. And I thought for a second, it was like Dr. Stranger. I'm like, this is pretty cool. If they go this route, and they didn't go that route. What they did is they had Falcon turn up the heat on the BT and he fried all those things. And of course, the whole place blows up. The BT is destroyed. So um, as uh, was it Scarlet or Lady J that says, we'll see if it's. You know, if we wasted a billion ta taxpayer dollars, and spoiler, they wasted a billion taxpayer dollars because the BET is done for. But everybody but they sell, saved humanity with they it. They saved so. all humanity, so I guess so it's it worth did. it. Yeah. So they can take more of our tax money and build more weather dominators. Exactly. I, like I'm that. sure Elon Musk is working on a BET. <laughs> Elon Musk. If Elon Musk comes out tomorrow on Twitter and says, I've developed this new thing called the weather dominator, I'll, just, I'll be... Terrified and thrilled at the same time <laughs> that Elon Musk wants to be... But none of these rich guys are really that cool. None of them are they are like in the James Bond movies or G.I. Joe with these billionaires. This guy just wants to buy Twitter. Like, <laughs> yeah. show me like, oh, I'm going to develop this new item called the Pyramid of Darkness. I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like basically um, buying Twitter, Pyramid of Darkness, that's it. <laughs> That's what I want to hear. Yeah. Um, and we're going to wrap up soon. One thing I wanted to say, the closest thing that we have to a G.I. Joe film in live action is the movie. We said the Delta Force before, but the big one is Predator. Predator, yeah. Once again, great music by Alan Silvestri. Yeah. I won't do it. But big guns blazing, 80s action. Man, when they used to make 80s action, don't even talk to me about this new Predator movie that they're making. Because I have a very different take on what that movie should be. I would make it a revenge story where the Predators actually come down from space. They attack the woman's village. They kill her whole family. She's enslaved by the Predators until she escapes. And then she decides she wants to take her revenge on the Predators. Make it a revenge story, not a, they said I couldn't hunt, so I went hunting story. <laughs> no, make it like, the new Predator movie should be like Conan the Barbarian meets Apocalypto meets Predator. Yeah. It should not be. They're not supposed to be speaking English. That's an insult to the people. Make it in their language. Apocalypto was a crazy Like movie. Apocalypto with Predators. Now, that's a movie I'm going to go see. Yeah. Um, closer to... Like old school hunting, like, you know... Yeah. Basic weapons. This is stuff. just Disney. Fox Disney. Crap. Um, they which, just put the same recycled... Yes. 
Disney has become a mediocrity machine. Modern day movies, I just can't anymore. Yeah, Yeah. Disney's become a mediocrity machine because basically it's like if you do something great, you have to stay great. If you do something bad, people will get mad and they won't come to the next thing. But if you make it just okay, people will show up, they'll complain minimally, and countries and places that don't really care or don't really understand that what like cinema it's made for other places that are not looking for the story the way we're looking for the story it's made for like visuals that's how these transformers movies and i won't mention where but these transformers movies are made for other territories where they're more interested in the spectacle of blowing up stuff yeah rather than tell me a good story give me a movie like the godfather part two or the parallax view or chinatown Or All the President's Men or Marathon Man. Mm -hmm. Now look, those movies have their place. You can't make every movie Marathon Man. But you can at least try to give us some kind of a story. Something Mm -hmm. new that we haven't seen before. Not these franchises. The Predator Like I didn't even see the new Jurassic Park. I'll see it probably eventually. Well, these franchises that haven't been relevant since like the Predator. As for Predator, Alien... They haven't been re- relevant since Reagan was president. Yeah, that's exactly. pretty scary. Yeah. And, and <laughs> Jurassic Park and Terminator, they haven't been relevant since the first Clinton term. Yeah, the first Clinton term. Basically, <laughs> after Clinton's first term, we didn't get yeah. any more good Terminators. We didn't get any more good Jurassic Parks, let alone getting good Alien movies. In fact, the year that Clinton was elected, we got Alien 3. So what I'm saying is, instead of exhausting these 40-year-old franchises, make something new. But we got to talk about Predator 1. Arnold Schwarzenegger is Duke. Carl Weathers is Stalker. Jesse Ventura is Rakondo. Sonny Landham is Spirit. And I would say that Bill Duke could kind of pass for Roadblock. roadblock. Doesn't have the muscles. uh, But he has a lot of the personality down. And he's pretty good with heavy weapons. Heavy weapons. So watch Predator. um, The first one from 1987. Don't watch a Predator movie or an Alien movie after the 80s. It'll just break your heart. Um, Yeah. And basically, final thoughts... I mean, that's the trilogy to me. It's Alien 1, Aliens, and Predator. Yeah. Perfect trilogy. <laughs> For space You're done. aliens. You're done. You don't have uh, to see Predator. Final again. thoughts on G.I. Joe the movie. Should they see it next Thursday if they can get to a theater? If you can get to a theater, it wasn't released in movie theaters. Now, I did hear some people online say that they... Um, I don't know if they were, they were in Texas and stuff, and they, they actually said for a brief stint, they did see it in the movie theater, like maybe one of these discount theaters, which is cool. Wow. Back in the day, back in the 80s. That is pretty um, cool. But like we said earlier, um, we we didn't even, and we're big we're big G.I. Joe fans, but it's like we didn't even know that they were making a movie. And they're like, oh, Until a kid it. at school told me to yeah. see it. Then we went right to Video Image in Staten Island, and we rented G.I. Joe the movie. I watched about the first half hour, and yeah. it was so good. You were away at a friend's house. But I said, when you, I got to stop this. I got to rewind it. We're going to watch it together because this is really good. And as an adult, I have to say, it holds up pretty good. Better than most children's films of the late 80s. And to think about it, preceding the movie, you had how many episodes in that first season? Oh my goodness. It was something like 80 episodes. Something ridiculous. You had four miniseries, which were all great. Um, I, I looked. You old. had about eighty something in the first season, about twenty five in the 80 second and season. And twenty five. I mean, like you're yeah. talking about like over a hundred episodes, probably. Of great I, stuff. I hope my math and, is right and, on that. And then you have mm-hmm. this movie. Now, a lot of people don't like a lot of the sci fi elements. A lot of people don't like this and that. But um, what I said is, at least it gave us something different. Yes. And you could look back, and if you're into things like um, about like origin, like like origin origin stories, like origin of life, or or like ancient aliens and stuff. I think to me, I this think is it makes much it... better than Prometheus. Well, yeah, the yeah, yeah. origin of humanity that we all come from Cobra <laughs> yeah, is it's much more interesting more. than Prometheus, where a guy just basically drinks something and then he melts into the water. Yeah, I'm like what is this? We call Prometheus the first church of alien. <laughs> the milkshake, like they say in twins. It was just. It right. was weird. Oh yeah, yeah, it was very strange. But, yeah, it was like weird. I don't know. God, and then they said Covenant. in the sequel, didn't they say Jesus was one of those alien guys or something? I don't know. Didn't they say that? Alien like, Covenant? No, no. In in one of the later, yeah, maybe Alien Covenant. That possibly he was one of the. Um, I just remember. I just suppose like that weird film. white alien guys in Prometheus, something like that. See, like I think Prometheus, if it had a really good sequel, 
it would have been good. Yeah, so because it was, it was a little too precious. Seen. Well, it's still a movie. It's but mostly yeah, movies. It's mostly movies. But it's still but too it's precious. Like, but yeah, it's just, it's very interesting. G.I. Joe the movie, G.I. Joe the movie gets a big metal horns up because it's yeah, still yeah, great. Metal. It's still badass after all these years. I like it more than Transformers the movie. I think Transformers the movie has a, a great first half and then totally loses it in the second half. Yeah. Whereas G.I. Joe the movie has a pretty good first half, but it builds and builds and builds, and I think it doesn't disappoint. And I yeah. think the and fact... you have Bridges Meredith and Sergeant Slaughter who make everything sound good. Oh, like yeah. Sergeant Slaughter could say an itty, bitty bitty <laughs> bag. Yeah. <laughs> Sergeant Slaughter is great in this film, and he comes in so late, and I'm watching it again, I'm like, gee, I used to think that Sergeant Slaughter was in this whole movie because I haven't seen it in at least ten years. Yeah. And he's not in that much of the film. And man, when he's there, he's great. He just he's good as gold, yeah. and he's still a great man at the conventions. I've it's never like one met of those him. movies like Christmas Vacation, where it's like it's great, great, great. It keeps building and building. And once uh, Randy Quaid, not Randy Quaid, uh, yeah, Randy Quaid, Randy right? Quaid. I, yeah. I, I, Got to mm-hmm. confuse with the other Quaid. I got to confuse with Dennis Quaid. Quaid. Yeah, oh, Randy, it's a once Randy Quaid, Quaid comes altogether. in there, it's like boom. It's, it's a ice. different Quaid. It's like everything is like so cool after that, and and that's like GI Joe the movie it keeps building, 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 and then uh, once Sergeant so, Slaughter comes in, it's like boom. Yeah. It's like light. It's like a long fuse. Now when he comes in the movie, the movie just when they go to Cobra Island, yeah. that was probably my favorite sequence of the movie. When they go to Cobra Island, he says like, "Let's leave our weapons home to make it a challenge." It was great. Yeah. He's like, and then, all right, no weapons. But did you notice the weird thing about Cobra Island? This is going back into the movie again, but we're supposed to be on Final Thoughts. This is going back. Oh, now. Final Thoughts, sorry. But when they blow up Cobra, they don't just blow up the Terradrome. They blow up the whole island. is yeah. obliterated. And then like Sepentra and those guys, oh, we were safe because we were in this special little bunker that rises up. I'm like, no way, man. The whole island blew up. It was like a nuclear explosion. Mm-hmm. And then like they were okay. Yeah, they were okay. It was like... By the way, how cool is the Terradrome? The Terradrome is awesome. awesome toy. I remember the Terradrome toy I got for my, was it 10th or 11th birthday? And it was an expensive gift. I thought it was gift. Christmas. Wasn't it Christmas? No, Christmas? it was my birthday. Oh, okay. And how I, know, how I knew I was getting it was we were going uh, upstate to Grandma's, and I wanted the Terradrome, but I'm like, there's no way they can afford the Terradrome. The thing is $50. No yeah. way. We're loading up the trunk and we put like, you know, some things in there like bags of clothes and stuff. And I noticed there was this thing that had a blanket over it. And I figured it was like the cooler that we put some of our food in. So I moved the blanket off and I saw the Terradrome and I went, no crazy. Way. But I'm like, oh, I can't say a word because I'm not supposed to know about this. And then yeah. when I got it on my birthday, you know, I acted surprised. It was one of my better performances. And I love the spaceship that comes out of it. The fire bat. Yeah, the fire bat. The pilot was, the pilot was cool. The pilot was cool, too. Yeah. You know, by the way, the pilot, um, if if you see, um, uh, what is that, that move? <laughs> Pyramid <laughs> that of movie. Darkness. I'm like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Pyramid <laughs> of Darkness. You know that scene when he's like, all intruders must be exterminated. He oh, kind of that looks guy. like that guy. They should have made that guy. That, into yeah, because the, the figure of the fire bat sort of looks like that. <sighs> That's <laughs> Twilight Line Ever. G.I. Joe or Star oh, Wars. Um... It's hard. It's hard. The um, original Star Wars line from the 80s. The original Star Wars line. I mean, it's just so hard to beat those original Star Wars yes. movies because yes. they're so great with the characters. <laughs> and I love the Return of the Jedi line because you got so many different uh, characters. Yep. And, and mm-hmm. that's when they were really making them really, you know, they started like really up in their game. The ones they made in 85. Things. That last and that Power of the yeah. Force. I love oh, like having the, having the Harrison Ford... Uh, not Harrison Ford, Han Solo, uh, where you could put in the carbon. Yeah, but, like it. but you can the really problem really was, do. to fit in the mold, he had a really fat neck. Yeah. So he looked like, uh, you know, Joey Roast Beef down the street. He yeah, he was a, He looked like a guy that'd be collecting well, numbers. Well, he was frozen in carbonite. Yeah, while, but he's so. very thin, but then he has this big fat neck because it's got to <laughs> fit into the carbonite. <laughs> but Luke with the Stormtrooper helmet was great. Yeah, Luke. And a few of those, the Imperial Gunner. I remember yeah. last day of school, it was kindergarten. Mom came to pick us up, and she she had the Imperial Gunner and Lando in this general costume. Yeah. And she came with the cape. That was a cool figure. I mean, the great thing about GI Joe is that, but I think when the Star Joe Wars was like really like done, done like you know, in the mid eighties. Yeah. Now it's like there's a Star Wars thing every five seconds. I'll never get rid of Star Wars. Yeah, now, now it's like now it's like uh-huh. we wanted to end. You know, which is it's both, time for the Jedi to end. Which is both no, awesome like, and sad. You know, it's it, yeah, it's kind of, but it's like GI <laughs> Joe, like other things, like we started seeing. Other sci-fi movies 
that held us over, like Blade Runner and and Aliens. Well, and we Predator couldn't watch those when we were kids. That, well, you know, when we got older. And oh, so yeah, yeah. Robocop Between and Star Wars sci-fi things, things and Star Wars prequels. Um, but it's like G.I. Joe, as kids, you know, we went from, um, you know, Star Wars and yeah. Star Wars collecting. But, like, G.I. Joe, like, you can't... I mean, that toy yeah, line... Right. Yeah, yeah, we're going to... That toy line, line G.I. Yeah, Joe, can't be needed. Be. The idea that they would make an aircraft carrier that was seven feet long, just the, the, the audacity to do something so do insane... And we didn't have one. We always wanted one as kids. But to be honest, even if we had one, where would it be now? It would probably be yeah. in a closet or in an attic or something like that. And I actually once wrote in one of my stories how it was Christmas time and the character is depressed. And one of the things he was depressed about is that for some reason, many Christmases ago, 1985, he did not get the G.I. Joe aircraft carrier for Christmas. Mm-hmm. And now he thought to himself, well, even if I had one, what good would it be? Where would it be now? It would be on eBay. It would be... Most of those, you know where most of those G.I. Joe aircraft carriers landed up? In the landfills. Yeah. So the birds would land on them instead of the sky strikers. It's yeah, like they didn't have a table to eat at. <laughs> you, know what? you know what, though? Like, those toys, though, just captured our imaginations as yeah. kids. Well, think about it. We were talking about this earlier. Look at the toy line. You have the sci-fi stuff. You have the military stuff. If you're into, like, you know, the gung-ho and the, you know. Yeah, like, leather nap. The, the leather nap and stuff like that. Um, you have the um, the ninjas. You have Cobra and all their stuff. Mm-hmm. stuff. So you have like sci-fi, ninjas, um, you know, um, army stuff. You have fantasy. a little bit of fantasy stuff with Cobra yeah. Law and everything. You have so much in that that one toy line. And to me, I think, you know, after a while, like, you know, with Transformers, and I'm not here to bash Transformers, they're really, they're cool. But, you know, I, but it's like, yeah, they transform into things. But after a while, it's like, just the depth of characters and, mm-hmm. and just... And you know what? And aesthetically, just no matter how it, cool, when you're a kid and you're seeing all these colors and not everything is great. You know what, too? Everything, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yes, and you know what, too? When you're a kid, I like Thundercats. Yeah. I like He-Man. He-Man was But cool. I'm not going to grow up to become He-Man. I'm, I'm not going to grow up to become a Thundercat yeah. or a car that... A, a robot that turns into a car. Um... You know, when you were a kid playing with your G.I. Joes, not to say that we were going to join the military or we were going to in any way, shape, or form, we just could connect to them because they were human characters on both sides. Like, we liked the good guys because we're like, not to say that we wanted, again, we weren't going to necessarily join up or anything Mm -hmm. like that, but the idea like, Man, Duke is so cool, and I want to yeah. look like Duke, and I want to, you know, be a cool, and he's brave, tough and he's guy. courageous, and he, he you know? goes back into the Cobra thing, even though he's, yeah. uh, you know, in there. And I, I guess I'll I'll close it out with this, and this is a great way to close it out. But I think one of the most memorable lines from that movie, and one line that always stayed with me throughout my entire life, is "We all go home, or nobody, nobody goes, goes home." And to me, that's a great line because it's like. Even even when I'm at my job and we're, you know, closing up, doing closing duties and stuff like that, I'm not going to walk out when somebody else is still closing yeah, up or wait till right. the next shift comes in. We it's to... like, I'm going to make sure that they're done with their work and they can leave, you know, and then I'll go too. We had because... a ma- I had a manager when I worked at McDonald's that said that one time, this was many years ago, and he said, we were doing the truck, we were putting away the orders, we had to do some stuff, and he said, you know, I, I said that... I got well. I got to run because I was just here to deli- do the delivery. And he's like, "We all go home, or nobody goes home." And <laughs> I thought that was great because I'm like, "Yeah, that was from GI Joe the movie." Finally, somebody that I could talk to about GI Joe. Finding somebody on the job that knows this stuff was like, it's like a little secret, uh, great thing because you're like, "Okay, this is someone who gets it." But that's true, yeah. And well, then, actually, I was at, I was at a PetSmart once getting stuff for my uh, <laughs> my dog, and uh, and it was so cool because the guy who was like checking out the stuff. He had an Arashikage uh, tattoo. I'm like, ah! <laughs> yeah, did he know what it like, meant? Did he know yeah, what he knew what it meant. And I was like, oh! That's fantastic. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. But you know what? It's like, the thing is, it's it's basically like, these, you know, Optimus Prime tries to do a PSA. I, I don't care. But you know what? Those PSAs from G.I. Joe, the Joes would help us out. And they would show us, they would teach us lessons. 
And those were something that they were forced to do. But you know what? You were they, were, nice. they were human characters. 42 Oak Street. 42 Oak Street. So, hey, Roblox, some strangers bringing me a We price. should start a production company called 42 Oak Street. 42 Oak Street. Yeah, that would be... Like, I have a friend that lives on an Oak Street. Number one happy street. And when I found out that he lived on an Oak Street, I thought, that is so cool. And I looked down the whole block, if there was a 42, and I found it. And I'm like, you know, don't, don't bother with that house. It's protected <laughs> by Roblox. Drive away. Well, the thing, I love how he's like walking down the street in suburbia and he's got a grenade. And well, you know, know what I loved about those PSAs that nobody ever talks about is how it humanized the characters, too. Like the Ninja Turtles tried it, but it didn't work. And the Transformers and other things tried to do these safety tips. It didn't work. When G.I. Joe did it, it humanized them. Yeah. Like Roblox is a cool action hero on the show. But he's just walking down the neighborhood and the kid knows his name, his code name. He doesn't know his real name is Marvin, but he calls him by his code name. (laughs) And just Roblox just lives in the neighborhood. He's just kind of walking around, going for a walk. And the kid says, oh, what's the bottom of your son? (laughs) Yeah, oh no, that's that's a whole other different different kind. (laughs) But you know, that was cool. That was something cool. And I said, you know what? That showed me as a young kid, these aren't just superheroes. These are real people in the real world. Like I could bump into a Joe. Yeah. And I'd probably be doing something that I shouldn't be doing, like graffiti and whatnot. Next thing I know, Flint shows up with like his little bullets on his <laughs> vest, and he's like, stop yeah. doing that. But another, another movie that's very, very quick, but another one that's similar to G.I. Joe in a way, was we love the movie Cloak and Dagger as kids, yeah. which is a lot based on video games, but the character of Jack Flack, played magnificently by Dabney Coleman. Dabney Coleman. He always figured that he was kind of like a G.I. Joe type guy. Yeah, he was like a man. Even though it was like a role-playing game and a video game. like a good Joe Colton. (laughs) Yeah, like the original Joe, you know. But, um, okay, so that about wraps it up for Mostly Movies. Is there anything else that we can think of? We all go home where no one goes home. I think that's a good way to end it. That's good advice. That's a good way to end it. Mm -hmm. We'll be back soon with more movies. Thank you, and it's great to be here. It's great to have John here. I didn't thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. It's wonderful to be here. And we're either going to have... I wish I could do this more often. Yeah, we've got to definitely do it again. We'll talk about movies. Maybe we'll do it via Skype or some way. But it's just so good to have you here, finally. to be here. And we'll definitely keep this up. (laughs) All right, everybody. Bye. Yo, Joe. Yo, Joe. Yo, Joe. Yo, Joe. Remember the one we were... What episode was that? Uh, Was that Lasers in the Night? I think so. When Wasn't they destroy the TV, when they, when see they break the TV, the because dancing they, toothbrush. Yeah, they like, gave those guys that were like uh, cavemen, sort of like yeah, missing like... links. They gave them. A, they they helped the GI Joes. They were like these monkey men. Remember? That? Yeah, that was like they were like cavemen, one. and they they were like a missing link somewhere in the jungle. And at the end, as a gift, it's sort Joes, of like two thousand and one, right? They destroy the TV. And it's like, like two thousand and one, but instead of the monolith, they get a TV at the end of the <laughs> they episode. Get a TV. Now I don't know where they got electricity. I don't know where they got reception. I think they had like maybe they had Wi Fi back then. It was the BET. They had like rabbit ears. The BET. <laughs> the BET gave them television, and the cavemen are watching the TV, and a toothpaste commercial comes on. <laughs> <laughs> I got. This find. is like my reaction to most TV oh my commercials God. today. We're going to find the name of that episode. We'll put it in the description. But we saw that episode and we were like, this is like, and and then like they watch in the commercial and the commercial's playing out. It's a toothpaste commercial, a little dancing tube of toothpaste. And they're looking at it and they're like confused and appalled. And then they just smash the damn thing into next week. It's like crazy. All right. But we've gone on too long. (laughs) This is like that album with hidden tracks, but this is like, an hour of hidden tracks. Yeah, it's like... Thanks again for coming, everybody, and thank you, John, so thank much you. for being Anytime. here. Anytime. Great to be here, bro. Good to be here, bro. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll definitely be back with more movies.